Father God, help us now by your spirit to understand this part of your word, that we would see afresh how amazing your love is, and that we would hold firmly to the truth that we have about the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you take a seat? It'd be great if you could turn back in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, that's page 981 if you're using the Bibles in the church. We're looking at the first uh, 11 verses of chapter 3. That's where we're up to in our series. Don't worry if you've just joined us. Let me give you a bit of background context. Uh, Philippi is a city in Greece. It was the first European city in Europe that the Apostle Paul visited on his travels. He helped start a new church there. And then he wrote this letter to the church from prison in Rome uh, 10 or so years later. And he wrote the letter to remind the church of the truth of the gospel and to help stop them being taken in by wrong teaching. We're going to look at this, um, these first 11 verses of chapter 3, and there are two direct instructions in those verses, two imperatives. They're both in verses 1 to 2. Let me read those for us. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. That's the first one, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out, that's the second, for the dogs. Look out, there it is again, for the evildoers. Look out, there it is a third time, for those who mutilate the flesh. So for the rest of our time, we're going to look at those two instructions. Firstly, rejoice in the Lord from verses 8 to 11, and then simply look out from verses 3 to 7. So my first heading is rejoice in the Lord, verses 8 to 11. This short and wonderful letter of Paul's is so full of joy, and that is despite him being in prison and facing execution because people simply don't like him talking about Jesus. Clearly then, his joy does not depend on his circumstances. Perhaps at times we're tempted to think, if only I win the lottery, if I perhaps change my job, or if I make my house nicer, if I find a girlfriend or a husband or so on, then I'll be happy. But Paul's joy comes from knowing Jesus, being made acceptable to God and having a relationship with him, something that no one and no thing can take away from him. And that is what gives him joy. Look at verses 8 and 9. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul has now come to realize that what he once considered gain is now loss, rubbish. What he once thought he could bring to God with pride, his performance, thinking God would accept him because of these things, he now realizes they will not impress God at all. The false teachers at Philippi were saying, you need to be circumcised, you need to obey the law. In other words, you need to do good things, and then God will accept you. They were encouraging us to put our confidence in ourselves and in our performance. But those teachers in Philippi were wrong. We cannot be good on our own. Just give me five minutes with a child having a tantrum, and very quickly my attempts to be a good person disappear, and I see that I'm in no way as patient as I thought I was. And Christianity is not, despite the common misunderstanding, all about trying to be a good person or getting into heaven by religious activity. The true Christian gospel says we should instead put our confidence in Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross. He took the punishment we deserve for our rebellion against God. He was the only man who was ever pure and perfect. He alone is righteous and acceptable in God's sight. He paid the price on our behalf and he took away our filthy sin. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we remember when we share communion together as we're going to do tonight. And not only did Jesus take away our sin, he also gave us his righteousness. It's a wonderful exchange. He took away our sin and in exchange gave us his righteousness. And so now Paul says, we have that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
How wonderful that truth is. God has given us what is impossible to earn by our own performance. We're now acceptable in his sight through faith in Christ and what he did at the cross. And that is why Paul could rejoice in the Lord whatever his current circumstances were. Now, it may be that you've never realized your need for forgiveness, that you've never accepted that you can't be righteous on your own. Well, consider that now may be the right time to stop and to ask Jesus to forgive you. It may be that just raising that makes you think, I want to know more, I want to ask more questions. Well, a couple of things to do on the way out. There is a, a booklet called Why Jesus, perhaps pick that up and take it with you. There's also a, a, a copy of Mark's Gospel. You'd be very welcome to take those and read. But why not also join one of our Christianity Explored courses to get together with others, to ask any questions you like, to think about these things more in the context of a group. And if you'd like more information, there's also details about that on the way out. What we do as Christians is not motivated by being good enough to earn the reward of forgiveness. Instead, it is a grateful response to God's kindness in making us his children. When my kids were born, they were given a little wristband, baby of. It showed that they belonged to us. Later, we got a birth certificate and then a passport, and uh, thinking particularly about that birth certificate, that didn't make them any more ours than they already were, even though our names were on the, the certificate and it showed the relationship that we had. They'd belonged to us from the start. Those other things just showed that they were ours, but didn't make them any more ours than they already were. And in the same way, when we first understand and believe what Jesus did on the cross, when we say sorry to him for our sin, when we trust in Jesus, then we are made acceptable to him. We become his, and nothing that we can do can make us more his than we already are. And that is amazing news, isn't it? So when we feel we're not good enough, when we have done something wrong or we feel we've messed up, we need to come back and remind ourselves of this wonderful truth. We need to remember what matters in terms of our acceptance to God. Not what we do, but what Christ has already done for us on the cross. Familiar truth? In many ways, a simple truth, but that is what we need to come back to. And Paul tells us, not just to know that truth, but to rejoice in the Lord, to delight in that wonderful truth. So that's the first point, rejoice in the Lord. Secondly, these verses tell us to look out. That's from verses three to seven. Now, as we've seen, Paul was confident that Jesus was all he needed, but he also knew that there were enemies of this truth. They were teaching the Philippians that it wasn't enough to depend on Jesus and insisted on certain religious traditions to qualify as being acceptable to God. He was worried that their influence would cause their faith to be compromised and their joy in Jesus to be robbed, and he wanted to warn them to watch out. Let's back up a bit and, and try and work out some of the details in these passages if they're not uh, familiar to you. The Bible tells us that God revealed himself to the world by starting with one particular group of people in one particular place. He didn't start with a great big empire or a powerful nation. He started with Israel and the Jewish people, a small, somewhat struggling people. And the Old Testament is a story of God's dealing with Israel. And right the way through the Old Testament, God made it clear that the truth about God wasn't just for the Jews, but for all of us, from all over the world, from every nation and every culture, a truth that we remember as we celebrate Pentecost this Sunday. The Jews had hundreds of rules that they needed to follow. Some of them still apply today, such as the Ten Commandments, and an example of that would be do not murder. But others don't quite apply in the same way to us now as they did to them then. And one of the rules that the Jews observed was that in order to be identified as God's people, all men and boys had to be circumcised. So anyone who was a Jew or who wanted to become part of the people of God if they were male, had to be circumcised. It was a sign of belonging, a sign of being clean, being acceptable to God. We don't have that today. Instead, we have the sign of baptism for both men and women, a sign that we belong, that we've been made clean, that we're acceptable to God through our faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. But back then, those Jewish teachers were teaching Greek and Roman believers that they needed to be circumcised. Have a look at verses three and four. For we are the circumcision 
who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now, Paul here uses the phrase having confidence in the flesh to refer to those who were teaching that to be acceptable to God, you needed to be circumcised. In other words, they were saying you needed to trust or put your confidence in what you and I do and in what you and I have. And that is what makes us right and acceptable to God. And that is what really counts. And as we've already seen, that's not real Christianity. Verse 3 says we are to put no confidence in the flesh. Now, sometimes people who can't have something try and convince themselves and others that it's not worth having anyway. Paul says, look, I'm not saying that it's not worth putting your confidence in those things because I wasn't good enough to have them. In fact, I was top of the class. If you think being religious is worth anything, then look at what I had. And I still think all of that is a waste of time. So don't let those false teachers try and make you feel like you're missing out. Verse 4, if anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, as the law required, of the people of Israel, from God's original chosen people, of the tribe of Benjamin, the best tribe, the tribe that produced the first king of Israel and one that had remained faithful when others had not, a Hebrew of Hebrews, genetically, culturally, purely Jewish. He was as Jewish as they get. As to the law of Pharisee, faultless in obeying the law. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, he was passionate to the point of fanaticism. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, I ticked all the boxes. But the turning point for Paul was meeting Jesus and learning that only Jesus could make him acceptable to God. Everything he had relied on previously to, Im be, to impress God with, he now realized was a loss. The only thing that was worth anything was knowing Christ. Look at verse 7. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He's using financial language here. You don't need to be accountant to understand him. It's like one day thinking you had 50 pounds in your bank account and the next time you checked your balance, instead of it saying you had 50 pounds, it said you were 50 pounds overdrawn. That's the change of perspective that Paul had had. What was now, what, what was previously gain was now loss. What was profit is now rubbish. Paul had thought his balance sheet looks, if you like, a bit like this. It's a list of all of those things that he listed and he thought each one of those counted for a huge amount in the profit column, giving him lots of credit with God. All those things he thought might impress God, he says, actually, they don't. What does your equivalent list look like? What are the things that you're tempted to cause you to be sure of yourself, like Paul was? Or perhaps looking and thinking about a list like that makes you worry that if truth be known, you're not good enough to be one of God's people. Well, in either case, the point is that you shouldn't rely on your own efforts to make you right with God. Paul wants us to know those things do not impress God. What he came to realize is this is what his balance sheet looked like. Paul says, it's not that I didn't have those things. I did, I just now know that they don't count for anything. So ignore anyone who tries to tell you they do, anyone who tries to tell you that you need to get circumcised or whatever our equivalent today might be. Don't try and do those things in order to impress God. Now, it may not sound like it, but Paul didn't despise his upbringing. The point is not that these Jewish things, these old ways of being are not right. The point is he no longer trusts in these things for his acceptance before God. When we become Christians, we don't need to stop being Arabs or Chinese or Geordie. 
We should love and, and, and value our background, but we should no longer trust in what our cultural or religious background tells us will impress God as we once did. Only the Bible can tell us how the world that God made works and what things really look like. And the point that Paul wants us to see is this. Paul came to realize that the only thing that counts is faith in Jesus Christ. His spiritual CV had it all, the right background, the right achievements, the right reputation. But on his balance sheet, all these things were nothing compared to knowing Jesus. He had learned not to confuse what really matters and what really doesn't. And Paul wants the Philippians to avoid the false teachings of the group who base their confidence in the flesh, because if they don't, they would lose that gospel message. And we too need to hear the warnings and watch out for similar dangers today. We need to avoid the same sort of false teaching, wherever it comes at us. And we need to hold closely to the truth of that gospel message. We need to watch out for the danger of failing to trust him completely and those whose teaching encourages us away from trusting in him. So to end, let me read again verse 2. This is Paul's very severe warning. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. You can see how strongly he feels about this. When he uses the word dogs, he's not thinking of friendly family pets, as we might be used to in this country, but rather dirty and dangerous wild animals. It's how the false teachers describe those they look down on, those who are not circumcised. But Paul calls them out using the same name to point out that actually it is that teaching that departs from the gospel that was dirty and dangerous and their teaching evil. So we are to be on our guard against the false teaching that robs our confidence in Jesus and his work on the cross. We're to hold on to that and that alone as our acceptance before God. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this part of your word and what it teaches us. And we're sorry for the times when we do again put our confidence in ourselves and in what we do rather than in trusting in the Lord Jesus. And for many of us, that gospel message is familiar. For many of us, this danger is a battle that we fought for many years. And we pray again for the help of your spirit to be on our guard, to rejoice and delight in knowing Jesus and nothing else, and to keep putting away the things that would cause us to put our confidence in ourselves again. And Father, we pray for those for whom these things are new. We pray that you'd help them to understand what it means to be right with you through the Lord Jesus. And on their journey, we pray that you'd help them to know more and more of him, that they would put their confidence and their hope and their trust in him too. In Jesus' name we pray.